Good evening. It's a it's a great honor for me finally to come to speak in Or Nava after so many great things I heard about this place. You know, you get so curious sometimes. So from, from finally I got the schut. Took years, but finally I got the schut to come here and. Uh, Honor of Rabbi Wallenstein, Wallerstein, you know, and the, as you all know, probably you don't need to hear it from me, one of the greatest speakers, not in America, in the world. It's a Baruch Hashem that we have the schut to bring people closer to Hashem. Every month, every year, more and more people are thirsty and hungry to come closer to the truth. There's no words to thank Hashem for the opportunity that we have to speak to people and make them aware of the truth. And finally, like I said, I have the honor to be here. Many years ago, one of the Mekarvin, a person that was working in Kirov, making Baalei Tshuva, bringing them back to Hashem, had a question if a person is allowed to speak in front of ladies. Because we see throughout the entire Torah, the Torah is very, very clear. Ladies are here, men are here. Even Noah and his sons and the daughter-in-laws, eight people, four and four, they had separate entrance in a teva. They went separately, the men and the women separately. When they came out separately, family. That's how strict it was. This is 900 years before the Torah was received. If you, if you read carefully how it was. Oh, Moshe Rabbeinu is singing. Moshe Rabbeinu is singing with all the men and Miriam take all the ladies somewhere else. Completely different. So he asked the Chazonish, am I allowed? to come and speak to the girls, words of encouragement? The, the answer of the Chazonish says, Et la'asot la'ashem aferu toratecha. Really, he says, technically, if you really review what the Torah says, black on white, no, you're not allowed. But there are times of emergency that the same Torah that told you that you're not allowed to do ABC, sometimes the Torah tell you you must do it. And in a generation that we live in today, when, he, when we have so many weaknesses and Jewish ladies, most of them are so far away from the truth, and those who are already in the truth, knowing Hashem, being aware of the Torah, also needs improvement, who's going to do the job? Rabbi Yuda Anasi, approximately 2,000 years ago, made a critical decision. What was his decision? Exactly against the, war, the law of the Torah. When Hashem gave us the Torah 3,320 years ago in Mount Sinai, it was a very strict rule. No one is allowed to write it, the oral Torah. It must go from word to mouth. You want to write it down, you're afraid you forget it, write it on a scroll and hide it somewhere. Make sure nobody gets a hold of it. Why? I'm not interested that my Torah, my secrets, the instructions how to do the law will fall into the hands of the Gentiles. I chose you to give you the Torah, you are my children, I chose you from all the nation. I am holy, I am making you holy today, and I only want you to be holy, nobody else. Of course it's open, it's free choice, everyone can convert and do whatever they want, that's true, no discrimination. But the covenant was between us and God. But then after 1300 years, Yudah Anasi, Rabbi Yudah Anasi, one of the greatest Tanas, the greatest rabbis ever lived, a perfect human being, the Gemara asked, who deserves to be the Mashiach? So they said, in this generation, if we review all the hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of Tanaim, each one of them was able to revive the death from his grave. 
That's how great they were. From all of them, everyone unanimously chose Rabbi Yehuda Nasi as the one who deserved to be the Mashiach the most. Big Chacham, 120 years old, he lived all his life, 120 years. He was the richest guy. He had everything a person needs. He deserved to be Mashiach, they say. Came Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and decided to write the Mishnayot, Shisha Sidre Mishnah, and save the oral Torah from being lost. If he would have not done it, probably wouldn't be here today. He wouldn't have synagogues, yeshivas, midrashia, seminary. He wouldn't have it. Because the Torah is really the oral Torah. The written Torah without the oral Torah is really worthless. There's nothing you can do. Nothing. Not even one simple mitzvah you cannot do without the oral Torah. God forbid, if we were forced by a goy to give up one of the two Torahs, if not, they're going to kill us. Choose one out of the two. No other choice. One out of the two, we would have to choose the oral law. Because it teaches us what to do. Yes, we would miss some of the stories of the Torah. But at least we know what needs to be done. If you, if you choose the written Torah, two or three hundred years later, nobody would know what Judaism is. It's all gone. So the Chazonish told him the same way Rabbi Yehuda Nasi made a critical decision because that was the right thing to do. I allow you to go and give lecture to the ladies and the rest is history. We're talking 50, 60 years ago. Baruch Hashem, there are hundreds of speakers, maybe thousands of speakers. The job needs to be done. The Torah says, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem says, Am zu yatsarti li teilati esaperu. I made a nation in a world for what? To sleep, to eat, to sing, for what? Why did I make them, this special nation? I made them for one reason, that they praise my name all over the universe. The glory of God, the glory of Hashem, depend on this group, my soldiers, my children. What's their job? To publish my truth and make everyone in the world love me and love my truth. How would I do it? I have people who I send on a mission. They work for me. I'm their father, they are my children. We have a business, we have to run together. Am zu yatsarti. I made that nation teilati esaperu to sanctify the name of Hashem. Many of you hear Kaddish everywhere you go. You go to the synagogue, Shabbat, every weekday. For those who go to Daven in Minyan or hear prayers, you see so many times you hear Kaddish. It's the most popular Davening. Kaddish everywhere you go. Learning Kaddish. Praying Kaddish, Mincha Kaddish, Mayriv Kaddish, Shachris Kaddish, Funerals Kaddish, everywhere Kaddish, 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 everywhere. What's so special about Kaddish? Why it's the most popular prayer in, in Judaism? The secret of life are hidden inside the Kaddish. If somebody asks you what's the purpose of the creation, what is it? The truth is, it's all in one, actually half a page. Half a page, huh? a few words, that's it. What do we have in this life? We have God, it's the top authority. Then we have the world that He created. Then we have the human being, us. And then we have the purpose of life. How many players we have in this game? We have God. We have the world, we have the people, and what's the mission? What for? Everything was made for what? We will never find a creation without a creator. We will never find a creation without a specific purpose. Everything was made for a purpose. Nothing was made just for the fun, for no reason. Why did you make it? Just like that, I don't know. You don't find it. And if you find it, Check well who is the creator of that idol. Maybe it needs to be hospitalized in a mental, you know, institution. Nobody wastes 
years or even days or even hours of creating something for no reason. So what's the purpose? To sanctify the name of Hashem. That's the purpose. Somebody asks you, what are we doing here? I represent the Creator and my job is to show His beauty and His greatness to all the people around me. And the way I can do it is by the way I behave. If I'm able to correct myself, to make myself pure and holy, like he demanded in his Torah, and then I fulfill my mission in life. And if not, I actually do the opposite. I destroyed the mission. Where is the secret of all this in the Kaddish? How the Kaddish starts? It gadal vid kadash meraba. Speaking about God. Name of God should be great, greater. Second, what does it say right after? Be'alma dibera, in this world that he created. So we have God, now the second paragraph is the world. What's the third? Be'chayechon uv'yomechon, talking about the life of the people. So we have God, we have the world, we have the people. And what's the purpose of life? Everybody scream, Amen, Yehe, Shmei, Rabba. What is it? What is it? That's what we were created for that the name of Hashem will be great and sanctified and holy and famous and glorious and so forth and so on. This is the secret of life. Now you understand why you hear it 500 times a week, everywhere you go? Because this is screaming to Hashem. We know, we didn't forget what we're doing here. It's you, it's the world, it's us, and what we need to do here. Religious people, not always I like this word, because it's very difficult to define who is considered a religious, a from Jew. Who is really from? Just a person that has a yarmulke and a beard, the beard is for free and the yarmulke is for two dollars. <laughs> That's the Mexicans and very nice sombreros and nice beards. Not that they have a lot of hair, but they still, some of them looks like the rabbis of Boro Park, if you really look at them. You go to India, some of them look like the Ben Ishchai. So they have turban, <laughs> mamash, oh, if you wouldn't know where you are, you, you maybe think that you went to Baghdad a hundred years ago. The outside not necessarily tells you who the person is. One guy in Mansi <laughs> wanted to, <laughs> to joke around with the people. So when they found Saddam Hussein inside a pit, the Americans were measuring his teeth, you know, checking inside his, inside his mouth like a camel. You know how they check the teeth of the camel? They wanted to humiliate him. So Saddam had a very long beard after months he was running around hiding. So they took pictures of him with a beard. So you know, today they have in a computer Photoshop. People play with the pictures around. One guy made an announcement the biggest mekubal of Eretz Israel is coming to Monsi. Everyone who wants to make an appointment, please show up at that day, that place. Everyone is seeing signs. They put filin on his head, the talis, mamash like a mekubal. <laughs> and everyone says, who is this now? I can't have heard of him. <laughs> Few days before the, uh, the exciting event, the visitor of the great mekubal, he made another head. <laughs> that's him, and that's the real him. After he shaved his beard, and everyone laughed, but that shows sometimes how we get fooled by the outside look, rather than look who is the person inside. We can, we can share, we can divide the religious world to two different categories. Religious people, that are religious for their own good, for their own benefits. It's all about me. And religious people that care, can care less about themselves. It's all about him. What Hashem want, that's my mind. That's what my mind is. What do I want? What's convenient for me? Which mitzvah I like? What's more convenient? Where will I make more money? Where will I become more famous, and all this calculation that people do all the time, that's one category. Very rarely 
you find a person that can sell his wishes, his desires, his temptations to certain things. Whatever I want, it's irrelevant, Rabbi. It doesn't matter. What, who, who cares what I like, what I don't like, which mitzvah I like more than the other. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I am here to serve my Creator, not myself. When you look around today, it seems to me that the first category is much larger than the second. Chazal, they already had a vision. They say that heaven was created with you, small letter. Why? Only very few make it, make it there. And hell, it's huge. Why? And there's full of rivers around it. Rivers? Why do you need rivers over there? Seven lakes? What's going on over there? From the tears of the wicked people. Tears of disappointments. What we could have become, but we didn't. We missed the opportunity. A person that listens to the, to the law of the Torah, to the word of Hashem, is not necessarily a person that loves Hashem. When you look at a person that wake up in the morning, go to prayer, put filin, put talit, learn Torah in the morning, he doesn't steal, he doesn't speak Lashon Hara, he watches his eyes, whatever he does. Everything according to the book. How is it possible that this person is not a lover of Hashem? What is he in that case? The answer is, many people keep the laws because they love only themselves. Who wants to be crazy to lose his power, his share to the world to come? Who wants to lose his business? Who wants to stay single all his life? Who wants to shalom, get cancer? People are afraid. First thing on their mind, if I'm going to be Mechal Shabbos, I'm going to lose ABC. Doesn't, it's not worth it for me. I know sooner or later Hashem will give me what I deserve. Therefore, since I love myself so much and I'm afraid about my future, I, don't, I do not want to play games. Play games with somebody else, not with him. Therefore, I obey every one of his rules. But if you connect me to a lie detector, when the question will come, do you love Hashem? And I will say yes, the machine will break to two. Liar, liar, you only love yourself. All the lights, egoistic, selfish, liar, addicted to the material, material world, only care about his stomach and his sushi and the fancy weddings that he's going to have every week. And how many thousands of dollars her wig will cost. That's not in fashion anymore. You need to care a little, little bit. <laughs> Come on, where does it say in the Torah that you cannot be beautiful to Vini and Richie and Ahmed in a supermarket? It's no problem. It's no problem that they look at you. Rabbi, I swear to you, what do you think? The, the fact that I'm wasting two hours, it's not really a waste. I have to make myself beautiful before I go to work. It's Chilul Hashem if I come, you know, without makeup. And I come, you know, covering my hair like my grandma used to do. It's not really good. They're going to think that we are primitive, you know. I really like to feel good for myself, Rabbi. I'm not doing it for the guys. One time a girl told me, I really do it just to look, to feel good with myself. I don't care about the guys. What do you think? You suspect me that I become beautiful for the people on the street? So I asked her a question. Tell me, please. If you would go on a plane, like just a week ago, the plane crashed into the Hudson River. Baruch Hashem, not one person got hurt. Nobody died. A miracle that never happened in the history of all the planes. From the day that they made airplanes until today, they never had a situation that a plane crashed. Mamash fell down like this into the water and nobody died. Sometimes people make it, but here, unbelievable. So, so I told her, let's say you would be on a plane and the plane crashed in an island and you're the only survivor. You walk around in, a, in the island and you're looking what's there and you only find chimpanzees, elephants, lions, dogs, birds. No people there. One week you tore the entire island, you didn't find one person. 
How long you would invest in your makeup press and the mirror and all this and blowing your hair and fixing it and all this? How long every morning? How, how much makeup you would put for the chimpanzees over there? <laughs> she said nothing. Why should I? Well, see, you lie. You just lie to me. You say you want to feel good with yourself. You want to feel good with yourself. They put you under the ground in a bunker over there. You have to put your makeup because you want to feel good with yourself. But you like to lie to yourself. Like 99% of the people do constantly from the day they become bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah until the day they die. They are busy with one thing. How do I fool myself? How do you fool yourself? You're playing with your conscience. You're cheating your conscience. Hashem made you a system. What does it mean, matzpun? Conscious. Matzpun, it's like matzpen. Shows the direction. Matzpen is in English, campus, how do you call it? Cam campus. Campus, yeah. Campus, it shows the right direction. Hashem made you matzpun to show the right direction. One guy, his car showing check engine. Blinking the light. He goes to the mechanic, he say, hey, what's this check engine? The guy checked the car, he say, your engine died, finished. You, you drove without oil, no problem. So the guy say, how much is going to be to fix it? He says, $10,000, no engine. So the whole car is $3,000, what the $10,000? You're right, send it to the cemetery, it's over. Then the mechanic saw that the guy is so upset, he's about to cry, you know. When it comes to money, people have tears sometimes. So he says, you know what, I have a, another way for you. Would you consider another option? You worry about the light? Come back in an hour, you won't have light, and it's going to cost you only five minutes. Five dollars. Five dollars, no light? Yeah, what do you prefer, five dollars or ten thousand dollars? He said, five dollars, of course. Come back in an hour. An hour later, there's no light. What did the mechanic do? Took scissors and cut the wire. That's the conscious. No light. No lights. Two days later, the car goes on fire with him together in it. Why? In the long run, you can never win by lying to yourself. You're only burying yourself deeper and deeper and deeper and by the time you will realize you're going to have to dig yourself out of that hole that you make for yourself. And that's not going to be that easy. So a person that listens to Hashem, not necessarily, it's no indication that he really loves Hashem. When do you know that a person that keeps mitzvot is really crazy about HaKadosh Baruch Hu? I can't live a second without thinking about you. Shiviti Hashem lenegdi tamid, like David HaMelech. You read Tehilim, you see, David HaMelech was in love with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. No question about this. Look at the words. Just you read it once in your life. I saw Chinese people reading it. I, what, what are you doing? It's the greatest book ever written, the Chinese woman say. In English, she reads Tehilim. She goes to the gym and reads Tehilim. <laughs> Very classy book, Tehilim, very nice. How do you know if a person is a lover of Hashem? Check him in the extras. That is what mandatory. What he has to do, he doesn't want to get punished. He has to do, hey, my boss is going to fire me from this world. My eternity is, is, is being jeopardized if I won't listen. I want to show Hashem that I love Him where? In the thing that Hashem didn't obligate me. You can do, you can do it. You cannot do it, it's up to you. When? I give you an example. Mishnah says, a farmer, in the old days everyone was a farmer. You know, people grew vegetables, cucumbers. People were, you know, vegetables in almost in every house yet. Obviously, people needed to give maaser. They have Shnat Shemitah, they have all the laws. A part of all these laws of, raise, uh, of growing fruits is to give 10% to Bet HaMikdash, to the Kohanim, to the Levim. I'm sure you heard about this. But the Torah says that if a, person, if a farmer took everything from his field 
and brought it into his home from the roof, not from the main entrance, from the attic, from the roof. He has a window in the roof with a ladder. He brings all the oranges, the bags, or anything that he just bought from the field, and he goes into the house, he climbs the ladder outside from the window, he goes through the attic, and he comes down with the ladder into his living room or his kitchen. Everything that he just bought in this strange way, he doesn't have to give 10%. No obligation. When a Jew says, no, I know I can go like this, I'm going to go in the front door, that's a sign he loves Hashem. Because he could have done it that way. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't violate any rules. Hashem gave me an option not to pay the 10%. But I don't want to be not obligated. I want to be obligated. I want to give 10%. I want to give money to Bet HaMikdash. I want to give tzedakah. So the, the way to check a person is when Hashem say to you, you can do whatever you want and you chose to do the right thing. When you are obligated to do something and there's a punishment right next to it, if you won't do, no. <laughs> it's an indication that you're afraid what's going to happen with you. In this world, if you really review people carefully, you'll see that most people are busy being an actor. Everyone is acting. It's all a show. What is inside the house, what is outside of the house is two different human beings, completely different. The way he speaks inside his house, to his wife, to his children, or when he's alone, in hidden rooms, what he does, what he watch, certain things that he do, the way he make a bracha inside his house, there's one Moshe. And then there's Moshe that you see in a school, or in a restaurant, or in a synagogue, that's a different Moshe. Two Moshe. Moshe for home, Moshe for the street. The Torah never allowed to have two different kinds of you know, split personality. A person is always busy. This is like the world is like a stage and everyone is an actor. The problem is that eventually everybody will have to review with Hashem together their entire show. All the show of all the baloney that we play, that we righteous and we pretend and we lie and we hide information and so forth and so on. One lawyer, he moved into his office first day, finally rented an office, he renovated the place, and you know, he said, what am I gonna do now to get customers? He started to advertise, you know, he put the phones, everything is ready, then he saw a guy coming from the street, entering, going up the stairs. Right away he sat on the phones, He's now very busy with business, pretending. So the guy comes, he sits, he says, excuse me, I'll be with you in a minute. Yes, did you send the five million dollar into my account? I checked this morning, the wire didn't come in. Hold on one second. Hey, hello? Yeah, just, I'll be with you in five minutes. In the meantime, start typing the contract. We're buying the building in Fifth Avenue. One minute, I have a call waiting. Excuse me, half an hour he puts a show. He wants to impress these first customers that he have by finally he's done. He said, oof, what a day. Every day is like this, I'm dying here, you know. So the guy said, hi, I'm the technician from the phone company. I came to connect your phones. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a very funny joke. But this is the joke of our life. This moment, just imagine the embarrassment. What would he say? Oh, <laughs> wow, where, where, where should I hide myself after such a half, half an hour of being a Mr. Big Shot, the greatest lawyer on earth, tycoon, real estate tycoon? Where would you hide? Where would you hide? One guy decided to finally get married. He got a nice shiduch, they got engaged, they get married. In the, time of, the night of the wedding, you know, in Israel, people bring the envelopes, like here, they give the gift, and uh, they put everything in a bag. Today, they already have safes. I heard that some, some people, 
They already announced today on the microphone how much each, each one brought. <laughs> Moshe and Sila Levy, $500. <laughs> Itzhak and Shifra Cohen, $5.50. Boo! <laughs> Because of that, I didn't believe that it's possible, but someone confirmed to me that this nationality, I don't want to say who, that's what they do in their weddings. One guy, his wife told him, you know, your best friend is getting married. We'll get back to the old story in a minute. He said, your friend is uh, getting married. What gift would you get him after so many of our events that he bought such precious gifts? We got to get him something real good, this guy. He say, hey, Miriam, I'm not going to his wedding. What? Your best friend, what are you talking about? You're right, my best friend. No offense, I agree. <laughs> I'm not going to his wedding. She say, why are you not going to his wedding? He say, look at us, you know, we're not doing so well financially. What would I get this guy after all the gifts he gave me? Thousand, five hundred, another thousand, another this, another that. What will I give him now? Fifty dollar gift, I'll buy him in Macy's. What will I give him? I cannot afford to give him the, the same gifts he bought me. So you know what? Half an hour before the wedding, I'm going to call and say that I'm sick. I got stuck, flat tire, my tire, somebody slashed my tire. I don't know. I'm going to come up with something. I got arrested, suspended license, I don't know. i rather not go there than stand the embarrassment of them seeing what I brought. What is it like? The Torah says, When you come to see your God, Hashem, in the mountain, the Moriah Mora, mountain, Bet HaMikdash. Don't come with empty hands, Hashem says. Ish ke matnat yado. Don't come, lo yavore kam, don't come with empty hands, he says. This is a hint in the Torah that when you come to me, you come up there to me after you finish your life, don't come empty handed. And many people come with hands completely empty. What mitzvah you brought with you? 20 years ago, I had a kiddush by my neighbors. Oh, for this I paid you a nice car, look. Uh, you know what? 500 years ago, I gave a dollar to the pushka there. Yeah, for that you got a house. Everything he names is over. Where does it say it? Parashat Vait Hanan, the end of Parashat Vait Hanan, Hashem say paying the wicked people cash to their face to destroy them. I do not delay the reward to the wicked people. I make sure to pay them in this life that I have nothing to do with them later on. What do we learn from this? That the righteous people, all their payments is posted for later. It's all delayed. Why do you want a penny now? Wait, wait a little bit, you get a dollar. Penny wise, dollar foolish. So, everyone is pretending, as in the middle of the wedding in Israel, they find out that the bag with all the gifts disappeared. All the checks, all the cash. Midnight. The Hassan and Kala are all after such a night, four hours of dancing, of running here, running there, pictures, you know. Where is the gifts? What are we going to do? Who knows how much money there in the bag? And in Israel people bring cash. <laughs> they have a lot of money under the, the floor. You got to get rid of it because the IRS is on the way. <laughs> what are they going to do with all this money? So they look all over, they bring the police, whatever you want, they don't find anything. Three weeks later, they finally got the video. They invited the entire family and neighbors and friends and everyone to watch for the first time the wedding. One hour into the video, the girl tells her husband, guess what? Maybe we'll get lucky to see in a camera accidentally who stole the bag from that under the table where we put it. They say, I don't believe it, but let's wait and see to the end. 
just before the video is over, they say, hey, it was right now. You see, the bag is still there. Let's see if they saw who took everything. Five seconds later, they heard somebody fell on the floor. Boom! They look around. They see the father of the bride fainted. Yitzhak, what happened? Get up. <laughs> what happened? They just showed him on a video. The father, real story. It really happened in Israel a few years ago. The father of the bride stole the bag with all the gifts and ran to his car and put it in the car and then he saw, he went in, the, the bag disappeared, called the police, wow, what's, what are we going to do, what an actor. Broadway actors are nothing compared to him. <laughs> and he fainted and he fell on the floor. And in Israel, the floor, it's not wood floor, <laughs> if you know what I mean. After they woke him up, he remembered what just happened. Probably fainted again. <laughs> Why do I tell you this story? The Torah tells us that after many years that the brother didn't see Yosef. I'm sure Yosef is dead already. Who knows what happened to him? Went to Egypt, what the Goim did with him. Forgot about him already. When Yosef told them, I'm your brother Yosef, the Torah said, Ki lo yachlu daber oto. They couldn't talk. Ki nivalu mi panav. You know what nival? Be'ala, the Torah said be'ala. It's the highest level of fear. That you freeze. It's like you're a dead person. You freeze, you feel your heartbeat is going 500 beats a minute. You can't move. You feel that your blood is not circulating in your head. Your hands are shaking. You cannot move from the embarrassment. When they found out that their brother became the king of Egypt, the treasury of Egypt, Nivalu Mipanav. What did the Torah say about this? The Torah says, Vayomer Yehuda, Yehuda. We call Yehudim after Yehuda. Man Omar Adoni, what can we say to your honor? Man Edaber Uman Itztadak. 3,500 years later, we are saying it every year in the Slichot, this, this verse. Man Edaber Uman Itztadak. Nachpesa Drachenu Venachkora Venashuva Elecha. What can we say to our defense? Yuda said. Yuda, he was a real big shot, Yuda. He was ready to go to a war with him and destroy the entire Egypt. The mentor of the truth, Yuda. Why we call Yehudim? He comes from the word Yuda. What's the, 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 the root of the word is Mode. Somebody asks you what Yehudim means. What's, what is it? It means Mode. Mode means two different meanings. Mode means thank you, and Mode means I admit this is the truth. I admit and I thank you, it's the same word. That's what Judaism is all about. Be grateful, never dare to be ungrateful to anyone, to any human being, needless to say to your creator, and always, always admit what the truth is. Doesn't matter who say it, your friend, your lover, your enemy, your teacher that you don't like, just always admit the truth. It's very difficult to admit. People playing around, yeah, yeah, but it was, it was cold. You know, it's not because of that. It was snowing that night. That's why nobody came to your lecture. Enough with Belloni. Enough. There are plenty of other speakers that snowstorms. Hundreds of people wait to there two hours before the lecture to see them. Just say, I'm, I guess I'm not such a great one. That's it. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? What's all this show? I tell you a story. Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, most of them probably don't know who he is. Because he was the biggest Anav in the history, probably, this guy. Hard to believe in this generation? In this generation, such modesty, such, such a humble person? Everything in the Torah he knew. In five seconds he was able to answer you the most difficult question you can think of. Computer is nothing compared to him. One time an Ashkenaz Rebbe 
throwing and he started to praise him non-stop. He deserved every word. Then he told him, Shtuyot, shtuyot. Here it doesn't matter all these words. What they're gonna say about me there, that's what we have to worry about. Yeah, the Rav, the greatest Rav, the greatest Mekubal, the greatest Anav. Beloni! I'm none of this. Would, would this is the words they're gonna say after 120 years when I go there, or after seven years, whatever it's gonna be? Probably not. In his case, for sure, yes. In our case, many people are righteous on the newspapers. Some of the rabbis in the world today, they are very famous. Who made them the Gdole Ador? The newspapers. Somebody like them, he writes in a newspaper. After a year or two, everybody reads it in a newspaper. They don't know really. Most of the people don't know who's really great in the Torah and who's 80%. For them, everyone the same. They're the same thing by doctors. How do you know which doctor is the best in the world? He's a cardiologist and he's one. They both look the same. They have the same equipment. They speak the same. You cannot tell the difference. Who can tell the difference? Someone is also a great cardiologist. He can tell the difference. We cannot. So if a newspaper will write about the one that is not so great, that is the greatest in the world, we'll buy it. And we pay it ten times more. And then he's going to send his master to the newspaper for making him the greatest doctor. Why? Because over here is the world of lie. Olam sheker. But over there, it's a hundred percent authentic, honest. You cannot play games over there. Yuda told him, I don't have one word to say to our defense. No excuses. Over there, there's no excuses. Just a few days ago, two days ago, we read the parasha in the beginning of Sefer Shmot, Exodus. Very important pieces of information are in this parasha. Maybe you didn't pay attention to the, all the details. Let's review some of the things the parasha had to teach us. First thing in the parasha, we are reading the story about Shifra and Pua, the Meyaldos. How do they call it today? The, the women who give birth? Midwives. Mid, mid, midwives. Midwives. Yeah, right away. People give birth at home today. Without a pedural. No problem, Rabbi. I give birth in my living room. In my kitchen. While I was still cooking the chulen for tomorrow. Accidentally, you know, I said, give me five minutes break. I give birth, I go back to the cooking. So what happened? The Torah says that Paro comes to them. Now pay attention to this argument between them and Paro. This is an argument that we have for 3,500 years all over the world. It never stops until this minute. Paro tells them, I want you to make an abortion to the babies before they are born. Which means I don't want them to be born and then I have to kill them. Make sure as the pregnancy begins, kill them inside. What did they answer to him later? They are like animals. An animal, before you realize, you have a deer in your backyard, pregnant, you walk around, you turn around, oh, there's already a baby playing basketball. <laughs> Two minutes later, it was just born. The little bumpy jumped on the trees, eating the leaves. He already knows everything. He has a doctorate already from Harvard. He knows everything about life. No diapers, no nothing. So, so they told him, I'm sorry. By the time we realized that somebody has to give birth, we did our best. We got there, the baby's already out. So why did Paro should have answered them? Who cares? In and out. Kill him. I told you to kill him, so kill him out. No. That's already a murder. Inside, it's legal. Outside, it's a murder. Where did it start, this nonsense? Right there. Because there's an argument. Is the baby is a human being inside or not? 
The answer in the Torah after 40 days is, 40 days it takes, that's it, it's a human being. Two million abortions were made in Israel from the beginning that of Israel until today, in 60 years, two million babies were murdered, legally, with the support of the law. Take them together, it's one million families. Three generations later, it could be 40, 50 million extra Jews today. How many Jews we have in the world today? 13.2 million, that's it. We just had a war. It's not over. It's a time out now. We just had a war. Nobody heard such a thing. 1,200 Arabs they killed in 22 days. Psh, usually it's 5, 10, 20, 30. It's already a big operation. Oh, the Israeli got really angry, the Arab says. 1,200. Not that many people know that in one day more than 1,200 Palestinian terrorists are born every day. Much more than this. <laughs> you kill 5,000 every day? They have 5,000 babies. You can't win with the numbers there. It's a snowball. 13.2 million Jews in one generation will become 15 million Jews. Why? You know. Every family has a kid or two and a dog, or five dogs. <laughs> the Arab, 17 Ahmeds coming out. One after the other. Ahmed, Mustafa, Saeed, one after the other. Like the deers. They born, two minutes later they play soccer. The mother goes in the market, sell vegetables, the babies are home. Five years old kid takes care of the baby, living simple life. No Mercedes, no fancy car, no five different plasma televisions every room, no half a million dollar wedding in Gaza. You know what's the wedding? They jump in the street and shoot with the guns. <laughs> That's the wedding. Yes, yes. That's how the Arabs get married. But you know what? The men separate and the ladies separate. You understand why we suffer so much? That's why we suffer. The most despicable people on earth listening to God. Screaming everything they scream in the name of God. That's why it's very difficult to win. It's not what it used to be. It's very difficult. Less and less siyata dishmaya. So Paro tells them, I want you to kill them inside. So they could have told him, what do you want from us? Send your own girls, or your whatever, let them kill them. Why us? No. Because a guy that make an abortion, according to the seven laws of Noah, deserve execution. A Jew that made ex abortion, it's not the same like he killed a person like this. It's different punishment in the Torah. So I'm a Ben Noah, you the Hebrews. Your law is lenient when it comes to an abortion, so you'll do it. So they say, no, you know what? Even if we die, it's worth it for us not to agree. They risk their life. My question is, what was the problem? You want me, you the king, you want me to be a murderer? I don't want. What is the thing that I have to do? I quit. I'm sorry, I had it, and I, had it. I cannot deliver babies anymore. I retired. I go, I sell vegetables in the market. Leave me alone. It's my job to be a murderer for you? I don't want to work. You cannot force them to work. I don't want to work. Why they didn't quit? Why they risk their life? Because the kosher Jew doesn't only think about himself. He thinks, what's going to happen to the nation if I quit? They'll bring two weak ladies, two Jewish ladies that will be afraid to die and they will start murdering the babies. And we are strong, so let's stay in the job. We have responsibility. It's not about me. It's not, I'm not here to enjoy for myself and to gain only for myself. I didn't come here to gain, I came here to give. That's the life. So they didn't care. He's gonna kill me for the truth? How lucky I am, I died for the truth of Hashem. Hashem couldn't save me. If he didn't save me, that means my time arrived. 
And if he saved me, I gotta be here. He didn't save me, that's it, it's over. I shouldn't worry why I got killed because I tried not to kill babies. So they gave their life to stay. The Torah says, Hashem made them houses. Rashi writes, Batim. As a Batim, which Batim? Batei Keuna and Levia. Kohanim and Leviim came from them, from Yochevet. And Melucha from Miriam. There's a whole calculation in the Gemara in Sota how it's from Miriam. The king comes, David Amelech. From Boaz, Chur, all this calculation over there. Rambam writes, the Gemara says that the nation of Israel received from God three crowns the crown of Keuna, of being Kohen, the crown of being a king, kingdom. And the crown of Torah, and the Rambam writes, and the Gemara says, the crown of Torah is the greatest one out of three. It's higher than everything. In that case, why Hashem didn't give them a crown of Torah to Shifra and Pua? Why only Keuna, Kohanim, and King? What about Torah? To teach us an important message for life. When you're born, you're automatically a Kohen. You didn't deserve it, you didn't earn it, you didn't sweat for it. Your father is Kohen, you're a Kohen. That's it, you got it. You're born with it, free of charge. If you're a king, you became a king, the nation chose you to be a king, actually I made you a king. You don't deserve anything. I made you my messenger to work for me. But when to get the crown of Torah, you have to sweat all your life. It's a very hard work. This you don't get because your father is the biggest trouble. The father of Esav was Yitzchak. Esav didn't become automatically Yitzchak. Yaakov worked very hard, he became. Esav didn't want to work, he wanted to be a hunter, to play soccer in a field with the animals. No problem, so he became Esau. Why God gave them everything that Hashem gives is measure for measure, for good and for bad. Punishment, measure for measure. You, did, did, you laugh at your friend, five years later somebody laughed at you in the same situation. You just don't always see the connection. You punched a person, a year later somebody punched you. You stole a thousand dollars, fifteen years later you lost two thousand dollars. It's always work like this, measure for measure, midah can neged midah. Where is the midah can neged midah? They say babies, Hashem should have given them babies and saved their babies from all kinds of tragedies. That's measure for measure. What's the connection, Keuna? Because the plan of power was to kill only the male born, not the ladies. Why? Because he knew that once the Jews will have Kohanim, they're going to get Bet HaMikdash. If they get Bet HaMikdash, then Hashem will take them out of Egypt. What is my job as Pharaoh? I'm able to read in the stars to see the future. My job is to prevent Bet HaMikdash. How do I prevent Bet HaMikdash? I kill the Kohanim. How do I kill the Kohanim? I kill all men. I don't know which one will become a Kohen. One day Hashem will choose the family and take the boys and say, from now on you are Kohanim and all your descendants after you. Since I do not know where it's going to come, let's kill all the men. Then the Egyptians will marry them. The kids will still be Jewish. They're still Jewish. They'll go to be slaves. I have plenty of slaves. But there are not going to be any Kohanim because all the men will go in. Goy cannot become a Kohen. What did they do? They sacrificed their life to prevent the plan of Paro to destroy the Kohanim. That's why Hashem made them the Kohanim. That's the measure for Mida Kenegen Mida. Everything you do in the long run, it's like putting a seed in the ground. Just have patience. The tree will grow. One way, one day, the tree, the seeds will become a tree. In five years, in 15 years, in 500 years, one day it will happen. It's all Midah Keneged Midah. 3,500 years after Paro, people are still arguing about abortions. It's not a murder, it's murder. 
people burning all kinds of clinics. Same arguments never finished. One of the things we learn in a parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu grew up as a, as a prince. Prince. People take care of him. He has no problem of Parnassah. He grows up, he becomes a teenage. He hears that his nation is adopted. His brothers and sisters are slaves across the street. A mile away. What does a prince do? What, is, what do you want from me? I'm an Egyptian already. I grew up here. What can I do? Cannot change the, the fortune. He goes every day to help them to walk. Just think about it. The prince comes, he helps, he goes around, walk around, give them lecture, encourage them. Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu could have sent them checks, money, donations. He take one of his slaves over there, go to that place where they work, give them money, give them coins of gold, whatever he could. Like the rich people in America send money to Israel to relax their conscience. Rabbi here, take a check. Let us continue cheating a business, steal, IRS, problem, insurance fraud, all these things. But we'll give money to the yeshiva. Then they wonder why in one second everybody collapse. Why people don't want to be honest. They want to continue to cheat non-stop. Of course, not everyone. There are many righteous people and they're honest and they give mamash tzedakah, baruch Hashem. But there are many that are not. And they get a lot of kavod, honor. Everybody admires them. If the people would only know who these people are, they wouldn't let them enter the shul. I see them because I hear all the time people calling me what this person did to him and what that person did to him. Uh, you don't need to believe me. Just look at this Madoff. All the yeshivot and all the people counted on him. Somebody just told me one yeshiva here in Brooklyn lost $150 million by him. All their money. They are bankrupt. Other yeshivot, universities, almost it seems that every wealthy Jew somehow found him. I don't know. I didn't find him because I couldn't, I couldn't even give him $15. <laughs> That's why I said didn't bring him to me. <laughs> so Moshe Rabbeinu is going to participate with the suffering of his brothers. No se ba'ol im chavero. That's a very important foundation in Judaism. You know what it means, no se ba'ol im chavero? The Torah says your friend has a donkey. The donkey collapses from the weight. They cannot pick him up. Go and help him. Don't walk. I'm in a rush. I have a train to catch, Rabbi. I have a train. I'm a... No. Stop everything. Help him pick up the donkey. That's called no se ba'ol im chavero. You live together with friends, boys, girls, doesn't matter. After lunch, somehow it's always the same one or two girls that clean everything. Everybody run. I'm in a rush. I have a shiur. My mother is on the phone. My grandpa. They want to listen to music loud. People are sleeping. They're trying to have uh, some rest. It's all about me. What do you care? I care about people. It's all about me, rabbis. I have to protect my own interest. People are cleaning, he doesn't feel good. There's all kinds of works needs to be done out of the place. Somehow he disappeared. And if God forbid somebody used her shampoo or his shampoo by mistake in the shower, oh wow, it's a thief, it's a gazlan. Five cents is not, it's not about the money, it's the, the, it's the concept. Like he never did it before. I don't like people sitting on my bed after I fix my sheets. Sounds familiar? I hope not. <laughs> <sighs> so Moshe Rabbeinu decide to risk his future. He's supposed, he's supposed to be the king of Egypt eventually, he's the prince. He's an important person. He sees an Egyptian beat up a Jew. He killed the Egyptian, he loses his career. He has to go to run away out of Egypt. Moshe runs out of Egypt. He could have been the king, but he didn't care because he cared for the life of another Jew. 
What did Hashem do to him? He made him a king. Yeah, it took a long time. Nobody ever lost by doing what Hashem said in the long run. What you could have made, you will make anyway. That's besides the spiritual reward. Nobody ever lost a penny by being mehader on the mitzvot, by listening and keeping kalake v'chamura. It's all an illusion that you think that fanatic religious people, are, their life is much more expensive. It's nonsense. It seems like it. it has to, that's the test. It has to look difficult, expensive. In the long run, Hashem gives it to him from a different door. Nobody lose from being tzaddik. Nobody lose from doing extra. It's all the illusion of the Satan, of the Yetzer Hara. So Moshe is risking his career. Hashem said, don't worry. You're not going to lose it. Rav Levi Yitzchak Mibarditchov in Erev Rosh Hashanah was very depressed. Very depressed. Rabbi, what happened? This year, you're not like everywhere. I see, as Ruach HaKodesh, I see that there is a serious kitrug, serious decree against the Jewish nation in heaven. Tonight is Yom Adin, is the judgment day. And I don't feel I have the power to cancel it. That's why I'm very depressed. I'm worried about my brothers, my sister. He walked out of the slichot, the morning very early slichot, tonight is Rosh Hashanah. He goes on the street with his feeling bag. He sees a woman. He was a very nice person. He said, hello. She thought that he came to give her Musa, because he was walking towards her direction. He was the big darshan, giving Musa to everyone. Big tzaddik. She said, Rabbi, I know you have a lot of encouragements, words, words of encouragement to tell me and to give me Musa. But I want to tell you something. I already made tshuva for my sins. I made tshuva already. So the rabbi said, what sins you made? So she said, when I was a kid, my parents died. My parents had a little store, a factory, that they make milk. Milk, they sell milk. When my parents died, I was 12 years old. I went to the landlord of the place, a goy. I told him, even though I'm very young, would you agree to let me keep the place and I pay you the rent like my parents used to pay you? So he told her, young girl, I'll make a better deal with you. I'll cut the rent by half. All I want is to kiss your hair. Not chas v'shalom to make a scene with you. Just to hold your hair, to kiss your hair. Your hair! Not touching your body. Just get what the hair. She said, I turned around and I ran out. That day I left town. That God forbid he won't ever see me again. I gave up the parnasah. I left alone with nothing. Quickly I had to run because, you know, this guy is crazy. And then, when I looked at myself in a mirror, I felt so disgusted that he grabbed my hair, that this guy grabbed my hair, so I shaved my entire hair. I didn't want to have any memory on my body from his hand. This is the story she tells Rav Levi Yitzchak Mibarditchov. So Rav Levi Yitzchak Mibarditchov started to have tears. And he says, what else can you tell me? She said, I also want you to know that now I'm a widow. A widow? Such young girls a widow already? She said, yes, my husband died a year ago. And now I'm alone in the world. So he asked her, let me ask you a question. By any chance, do you have this hair that you shaved? Did you ever keep it? She said, yes, I kept it. I never threw it. He said, can I have it? Yes. She took him into the house, he goes, she, was, she goes inside, she brings out the hair. He took the hair. Hair of Rosh Hashanah in front of maybe thousands of people. In the davening, the most important davening of the Shana, he got on the stage, he's giving his drasha, Yom Adin. People are fainting, it's not like today. 
Some people come to pray in Rosh Hashanah with their cell phone in their pocket, not the doctors, the others. Over there, they just announce Elul! Elul! Rosh Chodesh Elul! Half of the people in the shul fainting. Why you faint? <gasps> 30 days for the judgment day. I'm not ready. I just got a letter by mail. My trial is in 30 days. I'm not ready. I didn't prepare my case. I'm dying. He started to cry. He was holding her hair and said, look at this modest girl. She gave up her life, parnasa, business. She's a widow. We don't deserve for us that you do for us this nest and cancel this decree. Ase lemana. Do it for her. Im lo lemanenu. This is what we say in the slichot every year. Im avonenu anu vanu. If our sins are going against us, answering against us, the mekatreg, the angel, the yetzerara, Hashem, I didn't mean. Liar, you did it on purpose. You know that you're not allowed. There's nothing you can say. You must find one merit to save you. This is what I have. was holding the hair. And that's what saved the entire community, this girl. This Maaseh that he was saying in Rosh Hashanah saved everyone. If only the Jewish girls will understand the importance of modesty for one trillion dollar a day, they wouldn't dare to go one inch out of the halacha, one inch. They will give everything. They'll give their life, not God forbid, to put extra makeup. Not God forbid to make the skirt a little bit too tight. Or having all kinds of things that attract attention, like some of the religious girls do, not always intentionally. But sometimes it is indeed intentional. The Gemara says, one guy saw a beautiful girl. And right away he fell in love with her. Fell, you know, he fell in love right away. He fell in love. He, com he comes to the girl, he says, I need to marry you. She said, you're not my type, you know. I, mean, I don't want to go on the shidduch with you. How many millions do you have in your account? What do you do? First question in America. So what do you do? <laughs> what does he do? What do you care? What does he do? He offering you tzaddik for shidduch now. He lives in a tent. No, but we live in the 21st century, Rabbi. We have to do shtadlus. I don't want to live in a tent. I'm not Rachel, the wife of Rabbi Akiva. Wrong thinking. If Hashem decided that you're going to live in the tent, with or without him, you'll be there. <laughs> what do you think? If he doesn't want you to be in the tent, so you help him get out of the tent. But how are we going to pay the wedding? But I'm not going to have five carat diamond. His parents won't be able to give what my father wants for the wedding. How many couples don't get married because they are so foolish? They don't understand what marriage is all about. They think it's the, ni it's the night of my life, Rabbi. All my life I waited for you, 20 years. You're telling me to get married in a school? With 50 people? Come on, I can't. Man. How am I going to look at the picture? How am I going to show it to my kids? If you only knew how Hashem would be proud of you that night, <laughs> you will do everything you can to marry in a mother's place. Not a fleshy wedding, not a $10,000 gown, none of this nonsense. That's why we're paying the price today. Hashem take away all our money. You got sick and tired of all this fleshy lifestyle. Every corner in Brooklyn, Chinese restaurant, Japanese restaurant, Thailand restaurant, all glad kosher, of course, Rabbi. Just remember that Hashverosh in his meal also had glad kosher meal. But the entire nation of Israel was supposed to die because of this glad kosher fancy party. Everybody's supposed to die because they went to celebrate in a fleshy place. Just one generation ago, we didn't have one kosher restaurant almost. Maybe for the workers to buy lunch, take out. Maybe here and there. 40, 40, 50 years ago? Where did you have restaurants that people sit and eat in front of 500 people in a crowd? We didn't have it. 
That's why the kids used to be Gdole Ador. Today, Game Boy. Don't take my Game Boy. You're killing me. What kind of cool father you are? Everyone in my class has 15 Game Boys in my pockets. The only one I have, you took it away. Then they wonder why nobody become Gdole Ador. So, the Gemara says the guy fell in love with her and she refused to marry him. So he went to his doctor, to his psychiatrist. He said, doctor, if you're not going to do something about it, you should know, don't be surprised if tomorrow I'll kill myself. So the doctor said, you know what, let's speak to the rabbi, see what they say. He went to the rabbi. Rabbi, we need a special decree from you. Please call this girl and tell her she's not going to marry him if, even for one week. For him to relax from his crazy thinking, we're going to lose the soul of a Jew here. It's pikuach nefesh. Pikuach nefesh. The rabbi says, this is a Gemara, I didn't make up the story, but we're going to learn a lot from this Gemara. Hopefully you remember it for the rest of your life. The Chachamim said, Yamut veloti ba'elo. Let him die. She won't agree to have relation with him. God forbid, let him die. So then the doctor said, listen, you have to compromise. Don't be greedy. Okay, the rabbi this didn't approve this. Let's make a deal with the rabbis that she only going to walk to you a minute a day. She walk in front of you. She comes with a dress. She bought in Macy's a new outfit, gown, you know. She goes like this. How are you doing, Itzik? Like this, she goes. That's it. You just look at her. You relax a little bit. No problem. The Gemara say. They come to the Chachamim with this offer. Now it's not a sin from the Torah. It's not karet, chas v'chalila. You know, just a sin. A minor sin, but to save the life of a Jew because he's going to go crazy. He's going to kill himself. Chachamim say, let him die. She won't agree to walk one second in front of him. Then the doctor said, listen, these rabbis are strict. What can we do? You know, so let's offer another offer. What's the, the third offer and the final offer? Let her and him talk beyond the wall. You're going to stay here and she's going to stand beyond the wall. You're not going to see her. How are you doing today, Sarah? Very good, Itzik. Beautiful sun today, right? What time does yeshiva start? At 8 o'clock. Okay, I'm also on the way to my way to Bet Yaakov. I'll talk to you tonight for a few minutes. They come, they meet twice a day, they talk by the wall. That's what we call today telephone. <laughs> telephone? No, Rabbi, I don't go to places that people see. It's only on the phone. I have a friend. On the phone, a friend. The Gemara says, Yamut, and she won't talk to him. A Jew will die. Serious, not a joke. It's not threatening them. He's, he's really broken heart. He wants to kill himself. The Chacham Yisrael, let him die. Let him die that one Jewish girl will not speak to him on the phone. Not chas v'shalom about terrible things. About the weather. About the war. The Israeli army are back in power. That's what they talk about. News, politics, whatever. Let him die that she won't agree. How many girls speak on the phone for free, not to save the life of everyone? Just because we're bored, Rabbi. My whole day we can learn. You know, I finish the Tehillim every day, so ten minutes a day I speak to my cousin. What's the problem? The problem is that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says in the Torah in many, many places, if there is one thing I cannot stand, and I could not compromise ever on that, is holiness. Kedusha. Vera'a becha irva davar veshav me'acharecha. A place that there's one non-modest Jewish girl, I cannot enter that hall, that place. <laughs> cannot enter because of her. Rabbi, but it's my wedding. I'm sorry, there was one naked woman there, I cannot come. But it's our wedding! What, do, what is with our fault? I'm sorry. Holiness and pritzut cannot get one near the other. Who knows how many of us get married and Hashem doesn't come to our wedding because of this? That's why we wonder why there's 70% divorce in the Jewish world within four years. By the religious people is much less, Baruch Hashem. But it's growing. 
That means we're doing something wrong. When there's a problem, you can't sit and wait that the problem will run away. You have to address the issue. The problems that we have today, the main problems is people are not modest. People are not modest in their talking, in their walking, in their behaving, in their dress, in their makeup, and all kinds of other problems. Going to the wrong places. David HaMelech says, it's all about sacrifice. David HaMelech says, Shir Amalot le David. Samachti beomrim li bet Hashem nelech. That's, that's a very famous mizmor in Tehilim. What does it mean? Shir Amalot le David. David HaMelech wrote 15 Shir Amalot in Tehilim. If you know the story behind it, there's a reason why 15, because the water in Yerushalayim went down, he had to bring it up. Every mizmor, a thousand ama, the water came up. After the big flood with Achitofel, you can see the story in Agmara over there. One of the 15 Shir Lamaalot was Shir Lamaalot le David, Samachti Baumrim Li. The Gemara said, What is this? Samachti Baumrim Li, what? You happy that people speak about you, Lashonara? Since when a person is happy that people on the street saying bad things about him? What used to happen? David Amelech is now an older king. Bet HaMikdash is not built yet. The nation of Israel are anxious to finally have Bet HaMikdash. And they talk, when is this old king will die finally that his son Shlomo will build Bet HaMikdash? Why? Because Hashem told David HaMelech that since his hand spilled blood in a war, 100% kosher in a war, mitzvah. It's not chas v'shalom avera. But since finally a hand spilled blood on the soul of someone, these hands cannot build Bet HaMikdash. But your son will. But when? They're all anxious already. We want to already finally have Bet HaMikdash. So David HaMelech said to Hashem, I'm so happy to hear the nation of Israel hoping that I'll die soon. Why? Because they have good intention. They want your house to be built. I'm mochel on my honor. I do not exist. You are here and I'm nothing. What do you say? Anochito lat velo ish. I'm a worm. I'm not a person. A worm. A worm on the floor. Hashem told him, Hey, hold it right there. Tov li yom echad shata roshev osek batorah. It's better for me one day. Now that you're alive, every day you learn Torah, one day of your Torah, it's better for me for thousands of sacrifices that your son Shlomo will bring me in the future. Torah, it's the Torah. A righteous person like you that learned Torah with devotion, it's the best for me. And if you ever thought that King Solomon didn't bring enough sacrifices, I have news for you. How many sacrifices King Solomon brought in the first day of Bet HaMikdash, in the grand opening? Guess how many? I calculated how much money it would cost today to pay for all the cows and all the sheep that Shlomo HaMelech brought to the first day of Bet HaMikdash. Guess how much? Give a number. One hundred and 46 million dollars in the first day of Bet HaMikdash. 22,000 cows, approximately 5,000 each. Cow costs about $5,000 today. A big cow, oh, it's very expensive, but kosher, forget it. You can make $25,000 on steaks. 22,000 cows. 120,000 sheep, $300 each, 22,000 times 5,000, 110 million, 120,000 times 300, 36 million, 146 million dollars, in one, according to today's money. In the old days maybe it was cheaper, I don't know, but still. What sacrifice? And Hashem said to him, one day of your Torah for me, it's more than all his sacrifices. You understand now what does it mean, Torah? 
We see in Megillat Esther something ממש scary. I get scared to death when I read it. זה מרדכי היהודי. מרדכי, זה famous צדיק. מרדכי היהוד. The first time in the history you heard the word יהודי is by מרדכי. That's the source. מרדכי היהודי. Before that you didn't hear the word יהודי. מרדכי היהודי, דגמגילה סייר, רצוי, he is loved, לרוב אחד. Not to all his brothers, to most of his brothers. That means there's minority that doesn't like him. דגמרה סייר, who cannot love מרדכי היהודי? Everybody always likes to מרדכי היהודי. How can you be such an ungrateful person? This person saved the life of everyone here. With his courage and his efforts, and you have anything against him? How can it be? Believe it or not, who stayed away from Mordechai Yehudi? Leave us alone. Go. Don't come here. Who? Chachmei Asanedrin, the greatest rabbi in history. Seventy-one Tanaim Kedoshim and Nevi'im. All these people, Sanedrin, used to be. That's even before the time of the Tanaim. Everyone over there, it's, 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 a, it's a navi, it's, a, it's not a joke. All the chief rabbis of the generation stayed away from Mordechai. Why? Because he was smoking cigarettes? He wasn't smoking, I promise you. He was watching NBA basketball? There was no NBA basketball yet. What was Mordechai doing? He was a big chacham. He was also with them. He went to the king for some meetings. Politics. He's involved. He goes to the Knesset to speak a little bit to the people to save the religious world, the yeshivot. He's trying to save the religious world, not for himself. He went to convince Achashverosh and Esther, you know the story, that to save the life of all the nation of Israel. Everyone is dead already. That sentence. Mordechai is trying to give up his Torah to save the nation of Israel. And instead of coming and kissing his feet, the Chachamim say, you have Bitul Torah in your hand. Your Torah, you're giving up an hour or so every day from your Torah. The Gemara say, if two people sit and learn Torah, and one of them saw from the window a person drowning in a lake, and he ran first and saved that person, Guess what? He just got punished. That he had to leave the Torah for another 10 minutes. What do you... <laughs> I just saved the life of a person. The 10 minutes of Torah is a much greater mitzvah. People don't appreciate the Torah, they don't know. Hashem said to David Amele, your day in the Torah, it's worth for me much more than all the sacri- all thousands of sacrifices that your son Shlomo will bring me in Bet HaMikdash. Just before we finish, remember, how do you know if you love Hashem, if you're willing to do the extra sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice or you only do when it's convenient, when it's easy? One, Rav, Rav Zilberstein in Bnei Brak is one of the most interesting rabbis in the world today. Every one of his books is like a treasure. You don't have one page that you're not enjoying. Sometimes you have books, you know, most of it is good, but here and there you have some, you know, you know, pages that you will not remember. His books, every word is mamash fantastic, mamash very interesting, entertaining, questions, nalacha, all kinds of bombastic issues. He called the people of Bnei Brak. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want everyone to come today to this place to see the biggest miracle you can see. What's the miracle? One kid in Bnei Brak, <coughs> nine years old, didn't feel well. His parents took him to Catskin. They found that he has the terrible disease. The doctor said he has two, three months to leave. We must operate and start with chemo right away. The doctor explained the parents, religious parents in Nebrak, that you know there are symptoms, side effects. When you get chemo, you lose your hair. <coughs> but don't get panic, he said. After a few months, it will regrow. Regrow. 
The boy asked the doctor, non-religious doctor, doctor, what about my pears? I'm gonna, they're also gonna fall? Doctor, what can the doctor do? He said, yeah, but don't worry, it's gonna regrow. The, kid, the kids said, I don't want the surgery. No, no, I don't care. The doctor told him, it's not about want or not. If you don't take the surgery, that's it. You're killing yourself. No, I don't care. The parents are talking to him. The kids are screaming, crying. Hashem, like this. Hashem, take everything. Don't touch my pills. He screams, the kid. Not the pills, not the pills. Nine years old. What's nine years old? Fourth grade, third grade, what is it? Fourth grade, no? <coughs> months, he gets chemo. Months. Not one hair on his head. Beard he didn't have, he's a kid. Two long pears. Not one hair fell from his pears. The non-religious doctors in the hospital, you know how crazy they are about Hashem. They can sleep out of love to Hashem, these doctors. The doctors had tears. The doctors say in the history of this hospital, a miracle like this never happened and probably will never be. You know what it is? Everything falls, the pearls are there against nature. Nes Galui. What's it? One, two trillion, something like this can happen. Rav Zilberstein brought the boy to the neighborhood. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people came to look. It cannot be until I see it. Two long pearls, bald completely. The pearls are there. Why? A person scream from his heart, there's a different power to it. When it hurts, you scream. When it hurts. One guy came to a chassi that screams in a shul when he prays, he screams. So this guy annoying me, screams, I lose my concentration, you know. He comes to him and says, hey, can't you not daven like a normal person? Why you scream all the time? So he went like this to him. I. So why you scream? I. You just hurt me. You see, you, you see, that's the message. When it hurts, you scream. My heart is broken to pieces. That's why I'm screaming. If you don't scream, that means you're okay. You're not anxious. But Hashem says in the Torah, Karov Hashem, le me, le broken hearted. To those who their heart is broken. Only broken hearts. That's why when you make a shliach tzibur, they say take the poor person. Don't take the gvir. The gvir is sleeping well at night. Not anymore. All the gvirs became bankrupt now. But until two or three months ago, the gvirim were sleeping very well at night. I know a guy that, he went bankrupt many years ago. He, was a, he had an insurance agency in Israel. He had eight cars. He was doing so well, he gave his ancient cars on his expense. <laughs> After he went bankrupt, you know, in Israel it's sharks. They don't give you a minute. They come, they take everything you have overnight, you're on the street. After one year, when he was desperate, desperate, he didn't know what to do. Everyone calls him for money. Everybody's after him. He gets a phone call from Muhammad. Erez! Yes, who is this? Muhammad. What did I do? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm your mechanic. Where are you for one year already? He said, well, what's, what do you want from me now? He thought maybe he didn't pay him a bill <laughs> from the days of the business. Your car is in my garage already one year. I didn't know your number. I called your number, it's disconnected. Finally, I found Simon. I met somebody in the street that knows you and he gave me your number. Why don't you come take your car? He said, I have a car by you? <laughs> so well, he didn't know how many cars he had. He went, he took an Audi, $22,000. He sold it that day. And that's all the bills he had to pay. In one shot he paid. It's like finding a car on the street. <laughs> that's how good it was. Today, I doubt it if he has enough bread. But he's a tzaddik today. Then he wasn't. You see? What's better? One guy was trying to teach his kids to talk. One kid, 
תורה ציווה לנו משה, you fool. I cannot say two words. He goes to his wife, I'm telling you, this guy is mental retarded. Let's take him to the psychiatrist. Check, maybe something is wrong here. Two weeks! He cannot say a word. So the wife said, listen, come on, you know, he's only two years old, what do you want? It's all your fault. It's because of your family. All your brothers are all dumb. <laughs> yeah, my brothers are dumb. Look at your father before you talk to me. Two minutes later, they want to get divorced. No, don't worry, it didn't happen. <laughs> But usually that's how it starts. So one day he walked with a kid on the street in Israel. And in Israel, people who sell watermelons, they come with a horse and carriage. Like in the days of Antiochus, very old broken carriage, you know, from wood. They go with water, and they scream, Avatiyach, ala sakin, Avatiyach, with a knife, sweet, cold. They scream everywhere you hear. How people know to come down to buy watermelons? They hear, oh, go down and bring two watermelons here. The watermelon guy is here. Until today it's like this. Two minutes later, the little retarded boy became a genius. What does he say? Avatiyach, ala sakin. The boy heard the guy scream Avatiyah. He started to scream Avatiyah, Balasakin. He knows the whole sentence. The guy stopped. Okay. What's going on here? Two weeks I'm trying to teach him Torah, Tzivala, no Moshe, three words he doesn't catch. The next day he comes to the rabbi in the yeshiva and says, Rabbi, you're not going to believe what happened. Two weeks I'm trying to teach this boy to say something, nothing. We walk on the street, you hear the guy scream, Avatiyah, Avatiyah. Two minutes later he says the entire sentence. The rabbi told him, I'm surprised you didn't realize yourself that you need to ask me. Don't you know the rule that the Torah says, Dvarim hayotzim min alev nichnasim el alev. When Hashem created the world, He made a rule. What's the rule? You want to influence a person, the words must come out of your heart. If it comes from your mouth, it's nothing. Dust in the wind. If it comes from the heart, boom. It's a good missile. It goes right into his heart. When you tell him, Torah, Siva, Nanu, Moshe, you already dying. When this fool is going to catch what's going on here and you can go back to your business. You don't really care. You have to teach him to talk. That's it. It didn't come from your heart. When the guy screamed, watermelon, watermelon, what goes through his mind? I have a mortgage to pay tomorrow, I don't have a dollar. <laughs> my wife is on my head, I didn't pay tuition, I don't know what's where, I'm going to buy my soul, $25 a pound. Forget it. So he screams with his heart. Really, when he screams, Avatiyah, he screams, Hashem, save me from my misery. <laughs> That's why the kid called it right away. Because he went right into his heart. One Rebbe in Europe, they made a very big decree against the Jews, that they must pay a lot of taxes. There was a war. And the Jews were crying, what are we going to do, 80% tax? So they sent that tzaddik to talk to the, to the Caesar. But he didn't speak his language. He speaks Yiddish. And he's a Russian goy. Yiddish and Russian is not exactly the same, you know. So the rabbi comes and begins to talk. Now there's a person that's supposed to translate. But the rabbi talk and talk and talk and like this. Then the Caesar didn't even wait for the translator to talk. Say, okay, tell him the decree is cancelled. Take the paper, that's it, here, sign, no tax. So the guy tells him, I didn't translate one word to you what he said. This, the guy said, you don't need. I said, why? He said, I saw the way he was speaking. It was enough for me. He didn't understand one word. But why did he understand? This guy is willing to die to save his people. I can, I can ruin it for him. That's called Varim Ayotzim in Alev. A person walk in the street. Somebody hit him on his back. Boom. Oh. Who is this annoying guy? He gets very... Angry. He's about to turn around and give the guy such a patch. He turns around, he sees his best friend. Oh, Moshe, brother, mwah, hugging, kissing. Just a second ago, I was about to kill him. Next time when Hashem punch you, 
turn around and see who just punched you. It's Hashem. Ah, Baruch Hashem. Where, where you, Hashem? Thank you for giving me this patch. When your friend's patching you, you don't care. Oh, it's a love patch. It's a love patch. Sometimes you give your kid a patch, you're not sure if it was a love patch or education patch. <laughs> so the kid is also not sure. So he's about to cry. So the wife right away comes and says, Don't worry, Moishi, he was a love patch. <laughs> right away begins to smile. <laughs> the second ago he was thinking, Should I cry or not? What kind of patch was that? One family from Dimona. You know Dimona in Israel? They wanted to make Bar Mitzvah. Dimona is where Israel has their atomic place over there. The nuclear facility, it's right there. It's in the north, and it's in the south of Israel. A family from Dimona, they're not rich, but they have money. They want to make Bar Mitzvah to their son, but the boy refused to have Bar Mitzvah. I don't want Bar Mitzvah. What do you mean you don't want Bar Mitzvah? I want you to take the money of the Bar Mitzvah and give it to a poor boy in my class that I heard that his parents cannot make him Bar Mitzvah. And for me, you make a little party in the house, it's enough. No, we don't know the boy, we know that his parents, it's not, we can give him a little donation, what is this? No, I don't care, you can make Bar Mitzvah, I'm not coming. I went to the rabbi, the rabbi said, it's on Shel Adam Kvodo, if that's what he wants, make him happy. They donate the money to that boy that he should have bar mitzvah. He's an orphan. He didn't have a father, only a mother. They gave her the mother, the mother, the money, and she made him bar mitzvah. In the meantime, they made a small, tiny bar mitzvah in the house with their closest relative, and they were taking pictures. You know, they have a house open, you know, with a balcony. They take pictures, and when they went to develop the video, they saw inside the video an Arab guy standing, not that far, taking pictures of the uh, nuclear facility. Inside the video, they, they, you know, they filmed the entire family, but inside, in the back, they see a guy goes here, he goes there, he stands on a ladder, he takes pictures. So they say, wow, something is fishy here. They went to the Israeli police, they called the Shabak, the Mossad, the Shabak, they started to check, they made it, they took it to a laboratory, they, made, they started to investigate. A week later, they found who's the guy. They called him, he was a spy from Iran, taking picture over there. Real story that happened a few years ago. So the police, because they were great citizens, they gave them, they sent them a check from the Israeli government. How much was the check? Exactly the money they gave for the bar mitzvah, by the penny. Ah, and there are people who say, where is Hashem? I don't say, and One time I went to give a lecture in Queens. I see a girl, religious girl from, almost from birth. She goes to also Bet Yaakov. And she comes to me after the lecture and she says, Rabbi, you know, you know guys from the yeshiva. Maybe you have somebody, I want a guy that learns Torah. Serious, I don't care money, no money, but I want a good guy, tzaddik, for shidduch. I said, okay, give me your information. If I have somebody, I'll call you. But I don't think, I don't know, maybe a month later, I went to, the, to that place, the same place. And then she wasn't there. So I asked the woman that she arranged the lecture with her husband. I told her, well, your friend didn't come, this red-haired girl. She didn't come today. What happened? She said, oh, you know, she couldn't make it. And this. Then I say, what's with her? Did she find a shidduch? She said, she just got married a week ago. Yeah, maybe it was two months after the first lecture. She already got married. So I said, wow, very nice. She said, you want to know how she got married? Now I'm in front of more than 15 unreligious people. I'm putting my computer, my laptop. This is a night of proofs, seminar. Everybody sits, and while I'm connecting the wire, she tells me now the story. So I said, what do you mean how she got married? She said, when, we, when she came from Russia with her family to, uh, to New York, she was so poor. All my life I grew up with her and since we kids. Not once she had a quarter in her pocket. Not money for bus, no nothing. One time she went to a place, I think it was a library or something like that. A girl comes to her, begins to talk to her. Hi, nice to meet you, what's your name? Oh, I see you religious. Yeah. I have a shidduch for you. Who? My brother. 
The other girl is not religious, not mothers, no nothing. Your brother, for me, no. I'm very religious, you know. She said, yeah, I see, that's why I came to you, to talk to you. My brother is also Baal Shuva. He went to Monsi, he's in Yeshiva. He's learning over there, he was there for six months, now he's back to Brooklyn. And he's looking for a good, very, very religious girl. They begin to talk, what's your background? I'm Russian. Oh, we also Russian, all right. She introduced them together, they went out a few times, perfect shiduch, soulmate, Baruch Hashem. It turns out that when this girl came from Russia with her parents, her parents wanted to put her in public school, because they can't afford hundreds of dollars for yeshiva. They came from Russia with not, with not anything. There is a Russian organization that raised money from Russian wealthy people and sponsor yeshivot for kids who cannot afford yeshiva. Russian to Russian, that's the deal. One of the people from that organization found a guy, I think he was in Mill Basin here in Brooklyn. He's not religious. Save the soul of a Jewish kid. No, make a mitzvah, you wealthy, Baruch Hashem. Sponsor one girl. So, okay, I'm in. He signed the papers. For years he was paying this girl tuition until she graduated yeshiva. He was paying her tuition. When finally she's getting engaged now to the guy, she goes with her parents, you know, to make lechaim. They go into the house, and guess what they found out? She's telling me the story in front of 50 non-religious people. The guy is the son of the wealthy person that paid her tuition for 16 years. He was preparing his daughter-in-law, Habibi, I almost died when I heard this. <laughs> and I said to the people, no, you need proofs? Oh, Hashem is watching us. No, no proofs. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Miracle happen. All the time. Akadosh Baruch Hu, sometimes when he saves a person, before he saves him, he choke him a little more. <laughs> He's drowning him a little more. Uh, help! Shh. Be quiet. Why? Finally, ah, one father wanted to teach his son, El Musa. So he asked his son, what's the difference between cold water and a sin? So the son thinking, a sin and cold water, what's the connection? He said, I'll tell you what. He took the son pushed him into the freezing water. Wow! Oh, scream, ha! Ah. Then he said, okay, come, come out. He brought him a warm towel. So the boy said, ah, finally, okay, the suffering is over. So you see, now I hope you remember what I just did to you for the rest of your life. The difference between a scene and cold water is like this. In the scene, when a person makes it, it's very sweet. So when he makes the scene, he goes, ah, and then one day he's gonna go, oh, that's the scene. With cold water, it's first, oh, then when you take the water off, ah, you see the difference? It just depends what comes first. You enjoy now, tomorrow you cry. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends Moshe Rabbeinu to take the nation of Israel out of Egypt. Moshe doesn't want to go. Fine, you know the story, one week Moshe argue with Hashem, Hashem gets upset. What? I'm sending you to save them. So Moshe comes, and what happened? Not only that power doesn't release them, now he take away the store. It makes it harder for them. So the nation of Israel screamed to Moshe, what did you do to us? It became worse now. And Moshe screamed to Hashem, Why are you doing this to me? Since you sent me to power, the situation become a lot worse. Why? Couldn't Hashem just save them and finish? This is the test in life. The Torah says, When I love you, my son, I torture you. I choke you. I punch you. I take away your money. It's very difficult to find Shiduch. You don't know what's going to be. You have stress. Your diamond is only three carats instead of five. You can't sleep at night. Somebody park in your parking. One guy used to get very angry when they park in his parking. 
So he had a semi-trailer. You know those big trucks that, that uh, bring cement to the construction sites? You know those that they go around and they have the cements coming down? So he has one of these trucks in Israel. It's a real story. So when he goes into his driveway, he has a private house, he has to make a wide turn, you know, because the truck is very hard to park. And everything is small in Israel, small streets. So he put signs, do not park too close to the driveway. Because <laughs> if the cars are like in Brooklyn, there's no, no place to park. You cannot go into your own park, so the houses are too close. So once in a while people had the nerve to park too close, he smashed, the, you know, slashed their tire. He put a note, you know, those people that take crazy glue and put the notes all over your car. But one time he came to his house, guess what? A World War III began. A brand new nice car, not only parking near his, by his driveway, inside his driveway. Such a chutzpah. The guy is parking in his... He goes crazy, what? All the signs and the guy parking say, I'm going to teach this guy a lesson he'll never forget. He turns the tracks, he goes in reverse, he opens up the cement mixer, press the button, shh, all the cements go on the brand new car. And he goes with his shovel, make sure it covers the car from all over by mistake that he won't be able to open his doors. After an hour of hard work, he's all sweating, getting a heart attack, but he's so happy from the revenge, said, so this guy will never mess with me ever again. He goes into his house, 8.30 in the evening, quiet, turns the light on. Surprise! <laughs> happy anniversary, Dad! Here is the key, the car key. We got you all, all the brothers cheating, we bought you a brand new car. <laughs> What you cook today, one day you will be forced to eat it, Hashem said. Don't be a wise guy. One guy went to take a shower. If the phone rang. His wife, honey, I left the soup on on the stove. Can you do me a favor? Put the fire off. Now he's already took all his clothes off. He's about to jump into the shower. You know, it's cold. This... Thinking now I'm gonna go downstairs, he said, Oh, you and the, oh, you always forget things. She said, I do me a favor, you know. It's, it's, all right. So he said, Okay, no problem. He hang up the phone. Now he's thinking, I'm already no clothes. Well, I'm gonna start getting redressed. I'm gonna start dressing again. Nobody's in the house. I'm gonna go quietly downstairs <laughs> and put the fire off. And I ran quickly downstairs to my shower. As he walked down, he forgot the Alachayim Shulchan Aruch, that the person has to be modest all the time, even when he's alone, under his blanket, everywhere. So he goes, he comes downstairs, turns the light on, 300 of his best friends, his boss, his cousin. Surprise! There was no soup, no belogi. I know I made it a little bit longer, but I started also longer, so I, I have another three, four minutes. Shula, you are my biggest fan, but they, uh, they already want to sleep. It's 11 o'clock soon. But okay, I'm going to steal three, four more minutes from them. In the Holocaust, in the Holocaust, four... No, it's okay. We're almost done, Aldrin. 400 Jewish guys escaped from Germany to England. After a few months, the British saw they have 400 German Jews living in Germany, but they're in a war. So they thought, maybe they are spies. How do we know? We've got to get rid of them. So they wanted to return them to Germany, but the Jews refused. So they told them, you know what? We'll make a deal with you. We'll send you to Australia. We'll give you a boat. We'll bring the sailors, they'll, sell, they'll take the boat all the way to Australia. The Jews have suitcases, some gold, diamonds, whatever they took out of Germany. They're again on the road now. So they get into the boat. Who? Who was in charge of the boat? British prisoners. That they're already anti-Semite and they're criminals. And they made a, a trick. They say, you know what? We're not going to let these Jews... Uh, stay with all their money. We must steal everything from them in the middle of the ocean. 
as the Jews are heading towards Australia in the middle of the ocean. They robbed everything they had. They left them with one pair of pants, a jacket, nothing. No wallet, no money, no rings, no nothing. And not only that, these cruel sailors, they took the suitcases and threw everything they had into the ocean. Everything. They left them with nothing. They brought them to Australia. 400 Jews, not one penny they have. No food, no kosher food, no nothing. They all depressed. Washem, what are you doing to us? Why did you bring us to this life? I can't take this anymore. You know what went through their mind. Many years later, some of them became very rich, you know. Slowly, slowly, they build themselves up. Forty years later, forty years later, they don't know what happened. They found a diary of an SS officer, soldier. They open up the diary, and he writes in his book, in his diary, the date and the name of the, Br of the British boat that the German submarine aimed their missiles at and shot three missiles on them. But in the old days, it wasn't like today, you see right away what happened to the boat. It was far away. So you see on the radar, you have a screen, you see one stain on the radar. You know that's a boat. When they shot the missiles, later they check the radars, they see many different spots all over on the screen. So they say, oh, we crashed them good. Because now it's not a boat, it's many different spots. So they say, Baruch Hashem, we killed them. And so on. Then a week later, they see, he writes in his diary, they see the same boat, now with the face, back to England. How can it be? We crush them. So this time we make sure we go all the way there and destroy them. So we went with the submarine all the way there, boom, boom, boom. They crush them, all these robbers, they go in with all the money that belongs to the Jews, all went to the sharks. The Jews didn't know what Hashem saved them from. A person cried 40 years. Why Hashem did this to me, when in reality it was such a gift? I always tell people, why are you crying if you don't know your situation yet? Why are you cry? You don't know what's, it's a process now. Maybe it's now you're in the middle of the greatest thing can happen. Only a year later you'll find out. Same thing in, in Bris, in circumcision. Everyone say, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. Lucky guy, you have a baby boy. How do you know? Maybe it's another Asaph came to the world. I said in my last son's breeze, don't wish me Mazal Tov today. I just hope that you'll come when he's going to be 18 years old. Then I will deserve a Mazal Tov. Because maybe he's Mazal Ra now. We don't know. You know what's going to come out of him? When, he, when Asaph was born, everyone came to Yitzchak and say Mazal Tov. If they only knew what comes out of this boy, what a monster, they say, we feel bad for you. It's hard. We came to cheer you up. We feel bad for you. You know, if you need anything, call us. Person doesn't know a thing, but he's always thinking, wondering, happy, crying. The Nazis decided that they have to get rid of some of the Jews. And they send the doctor to examine the kids while they're sleeping. Who is strong <coughs> and who is already too skinny to kill him. And they say to the doctor, the sign is that you take away the yamaka. Those who are supposed to die, take the yamaka and bring it out. In the morning we're going to come, we'll see the kids that don't have yamaka, we'll know we have to kill them. In the middle of the night, one of the kids needs a bathroom. Two, three o'clock at night, he woke up. He's looking in bed for his yamaka, but he's a tzaddik. He said, the Shulchan Aruch said, a person should not make four steps without covering his head. What's going to be? You know, they sleep like sardines. It's not your bed is here and his bed is over there. Sardines. Right next, next to him, he reached out the yamaka of his friend. He's in, the, he's in the middle of a sleep. He took his yamaka, I said, I use it, and put it back. Tomorrow I look for my yamaka. He took the yamak of his friend, he went to the bathroom, he came back, he made a bracha, he fell asleep. The morning they come, they see that his next door friend 
next bed next to him, as does an every yamaka, they took him and killed him. Send a letter to Rav Zilberstein, do I have to make tshuva for this? Am I guilty in the death of my friend? What do you think the answer is? We find in the Torah that if a boss sends his driver on a mission and he had an accident and he died, that you need chapara, even though you're not a killer, you're not a prophet, you didn't know what's going to happen. The fact that thanks to you, you send someone on a mission and something bad happened to him, it's not a coincidence that Hashem brought this tragedy for you. Therefore, you have to make tshuva for it in this. But in this case, there's no tshuva, no nothing. He's completely innocent. Why? He didn't send his friend to any mission. He did what the Allah has said. Doing what the Allah has said, and God forbid another Jew died because of that, it's 100% Hashem. It's nothing to do with you. Life and death is not in our hand, it's in the hands of Hashem. After the Holocaust, the Rebbe from Klosenburg came to Union City, New Jersey, not far from here. He had hundreds of Hasidim that came with him on the boat. Completely poor. Nobody ever penny. They landed here in Union, New Jersey over there. And there's a Klosenburg Hasidut over there until today. And they have in Monsi and in other places. He had with him extra pair of tzitzit. One used tzitzit for, of his own. In his own, nobody has tzitzit. He wanted to give this tzitzit out. I have already one. Let me give one of them. At least another Jew will have the mitzvah. So he decided to make a lottery. People will pick up a number. One Jew jumped. You know what's going to happen. My chances are very small to get the tzitzit. But he's so fanatic to Hashem. He took his only shirt. What did he have? One shirt. He cut it right away. He ripped the shirt from both sides, and now the shirt has four corners. This, that second, he is now obligated from the Torah. Until now, you don't have tzitzit, you're not obligated. You're not wearing a, a, a shirt with four corners. But now he made his shirt, must get a tzitzit. He has to get a tzitzit. So he told the Rebbe, Rebbe, you cannot make a lottery. They don't have the obligation for the mitzvah. I do. I have one shirt, cannot go naked. Now I have an obligation from the Torah to have tzitzit, you have to give it to me. So the Rebbe was confused, what should he do? The Rebbe said, I'm sorry, I already announced that I'm making a lottery, it's Hilul Hashem, I can't do it. But if you're so anxious for Hashem, as it seems, I have no doubt in my mind that the lottery will choose you. And that's what happened. From hundreds of people, this number came up. What do you see from this? When you show Hashem, you give your heart for mitzvah. You have one shirt in your life. People, before, when they go to the Kotel, they make sure they wear the worst shirt that they have in their closet. Why you wore this shirt that since you were bar mitzvah, you never wore it, Moshe? You crazy? I'm gonna spend $30? I have to rip the shirt when I go to the Kotel. I make sure I wore... People that know their father is about to die any minute, they make sure they go change clothes. Rabbi, what? I'm going to lose. I'm going to have to rip the jacket. It's Baltashri. He had one shirt. He ripped it. I want to have the mitzvah of tzitzit. I want to have the mitzvah of tzitzit. Sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice. Rav Steinman came to Lakewood. And that's the last story for tonight. <laughs> You're laughing at me, huh? I'll tell your rabbi, don't worry. We have to have another Shula, you are not <laughs> an example, Shula. I know you. In a seminar, usually you... Usually you're like three hours, though. You're ah. short, you're short enough, so usually like three hours. Ah, really? Oh, very good. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll take it serious. Be careful. Shh. Everywhere. Everywhere. Shh. Okay, last story. Last story. Shh. No, two stories, two more stories. <laughs> no, no, two more stories. <laughs> two more stories. Rav Steinman came to Lakewood. Rav Steinman came to Lakewood, to Rav Kotler. He sits in his Shabbos table and he sees in the wall unit two shoes. Very old shoes. Dusty. Inside the wall unit with all the silver. 
sho- who put shoes inside his wall unit. The rabbi couldn't hold his curiosity and he said to Rav Kotler, what those shoes are inside the wall unit? I have never seen such a thing. He told him, you want to know where these shoes came from? I inherited them from my father. And how did my father have them? That's not his shoes. He bought them from one Talmud is in Yeshiva. Why he bought the shoes? In the time of the war, the Rebbe said to the students, Rav Iser Zalman Meltzer, Zecher Tzadik Livrachai, was the Rosh Yeshiva. He told them, I'm sorry, I cannot have you in Yeshiva. Missiles are falling everywhere here. Everyone take the train and go back home until after the war. Everyone went home. One Talmud, his name Eliezer. He comes home. His mother said, a blazer? What are you doing here? So the Rebbe sent us home. Bombs are falling. He said, what? You think you're going to be safer at home? Don't you Rebbe know that the Torah Magna in Matzla, the Torah is, is our survivor? The Torah is surviving us. Thanks to the Torah we're around. Who kept us 3,300 years? I'm sorry, go back. I don't have money. I had money to go back and forth that you gave me. I wasted it, that's it. You have money to give me? She said, I don't have. People were very poor those days, not like today. She said, I'm sorry, I'm not giving up. Walk. One week it takes to walk back to the yeshiva. It's hundreds of miles. Hundreds of miles in freezing weather, 20 below zero. He walked one week, this young guy. When he walked into the yeshiva, the Rebbe was alone there learning with the books. The Rebbe looks at him, what are you doing here? How did you get here? Didn't I send you home? He said, yeah, but my mother got very upset at you. She sent me back to the yeshiva. And I didn't have money for the train, and I had to walk. And I walk from my home to here. Abi says such a thing, I wish I knew, I wouldn't let you go. He felt so guilty, the Rav. I must do something for this boy. He looked at his shoes, he said, can I ask you a favor? I want to buy these shoes from you. He gave them a nice amount of money. He bought those shoes from him. And he kept those shoes. This uh, person who sacrificed his efforts, his neshama for the Torah, walked for a week to learn Torah. This is for me better than all the diamonds in the world together. Ladies and no gentlemen here. So it's ladies and ladies. Who was this Talmud? Rav Shach. 110 years old. Rav Shach, what do you think? You become the leader of the religious world accidentally? And Hashem, see, Habibi, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. What needs to be done? You want me to walk all the way from here to China? I'm getting ready in a minute. What? Hashem? Come on. You think I'm Avraham Avinu? <laughs> what does it mean, walk now? I'm innocent. Walk, bombs, pikuach nefesh. Let me sleep. No. One girl went to Bess Yaakov in, v- in Vienna. This is all true story. None of the stories I told you, it's all real, authentic story from life. She found out that her voice is extremely beautiful. She sings opera, uh, amazing. She's in a choir of the religious school, for girls only, but you know how the Yetzer arise. Everybody tells her, wow, Esti, your, name, your voice is amazing. It's, it's hard to believe such voice. You could be such a star. The Yetzer Ara got into her. One day she walked in the street, she saw an ad. They're looking for a lead singer for the Vienna Orchestra. Psh, what a career. Standing all the world, flying, first class, famous. She went to the choir to get test, tested, audition. The guy that heard her voice almost fainted. Come, come, come. 
quick, sign here, sign here, sign here, you got the job. They didn't even check the other girls that came. Right away, the voice was ah, amazing. When she comes back home, dad, mom, tati, mommy, I have news for you. Your daughter will help you for the rest of your life financially. You help us. Yeah, I'm going to be a star. I'm going to be very rich. The father starts to cry. How did it happen to us? All my sons are in yeshivot. My, what is this? What a tragedy. They're begging her. Nothing helps. They bring the rabbis from the town. Nothing helps. One day, a big rab come to town. The father ran to the tzaddik. Save my daughter. Do something. Bring her over. The rabbi is speaking to her for one hour, one of the Gdolei Ador. She is stubborn. No, it's my chance in my lifetime. He said life is all about sacrificing. The more you sacrifice, the more you will earn in the long run. I know it's hard for you. No, I'm sorry, rabbi. Please don't put pressure on me. Then the rabbi said, okay, I'll give you an offer. If you will agree to give up this job, I'm going to make now a decree, I give you a bracha, that your son will be the light of the world, the Gdolador. The bigger, one of the biggest in the world. She think, what's better? Famous, money, singing, become a Goya? Oh, my son will be Gdolador. In those days they knew what Gdolador is. And the Gdola door was a real Gdola door, not from the newspapers. A real one. It was very difficult for her. She cried, she fought with herself, but she said, you know what, Rabbi? I know it's hard for me, I have to make it. Okay. He said, that's it. I made this prayer for you now. Your son will be Gdola door. Who is their son? Still alive today. Who? Who is the biggest Ashkenazi posek? One of the top three in the world. Rav Shmuel Levi Vozner. The Av Bedin, the famous Halacha books. <laughs> Every question, complicated question, goes directly to him. You have Rav Eliashiv, and you have Rav Vozner, and you have Rav Kanievsky. The top three in the world. That's our son. Rav Don Segal said the story. How did he find out about it? He went to Austria, Vienna. There's a Jewish museum over there. And he saw that story inside the diary of the shul. The shul, they used to write what happened that week. And he didn't, he didn't believe it 100%. He said, wow, such story happened? So he came to Rav Vosner in Bnei Brak. Confirm this story for me, please. He said, when I wasn't learning good, my mother said, learn, Shmuel, learn. If you know what I gave up for you to learn, you wouldn't waste time. Learn. <laughs> I guess it's true. Thank you very much. Good night.